words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Cross our fingers, but uh, we're actually currently working on the, the, the top uh, project where we're actually developing an assessment tool that's specifically designed for seminary students. And uh, hope, Lord willing, later this fall, we will be pilot testing this, uh, an early version of this tool at a Catholic seminary, a uh, historically African American seminary, mainline seminary, and a few evangelical seminaries. And we're hoping that the next phase or the next grant that we're applying to is where we're gonna actually launch this tool at uh, 12 to 14 different seminaries and we're gonna use it to collect longitudinal data over a course of uh, three years. And our dream is to expand another three years after that and go international so we can kind of look at this across different cultures. So, and as uh, Angela just mentioned, uh, one of the great blessings of projects such as these is it brings together lots of people that really need to be brought together, but th oftentimes they need an occasion to do that. And, um, thus far, we have about 12 different seminaries throughout North America, again, uh, involving, including Catholic, mainline, uh, evangelical seminaries uh, represented in our uh, grant uh, project. So where I'd like to start off with is by sharing some of the initial uh, questions that led a lot of us into our interest in uh, assessment and spiritual formation. And the first question is kind of one of those pie-in-the-sky questions where we may not ever know the, the re, you know, exact answer to it, um, but it still guides our, uh, our work. And the question is this, what is the relationship between spiritual formation and character development? Right? Or, or that is, another way to say it is, uh, does being spiritually mature, however you define spiritual maturity, because there's a lot of different ways you can define it, does that necessarily mean that you're going to be a better person? Does that necessarily mean that you're going to be more virtuous? Does it mean you're going to be more humble? Does it mean you're going to have more gratitude? Does it mean that you're going to be more generous? And as we pressed into this question, many of us who have attended seminaries ourselves, a lot of us, we, we came back to those individuals that we met along the way that got straight A's, that knew their, how to do their exegesis, that uh, knew their Greek and Hebrew, but they're kind of a jerk, <laughs> and we don't really trust them, right? So, you know, here we have individuals that have certain markers of spiritual maturity, and yet they might still suffer from very profound deficits in their character, right? So what is the relationship then? It may not be a perfect one-to-one -one relationship, but we're not ready to ditch, you know, throw the baby out of the bathwater. So things like exegesis and scripture and biblical knowledge, they're still part of the pie, but we need to know more. Um, a second question that uh, led to our interest is uh, this question. What is currently being done in seminaries to shape the character and spiritual lives uh, of their students? And as we began to uh, bring together various um, you know, individuals who are engaged or on the front lines of this kind of work in their seminary institutions, we began to realize that by and large, again, people weren't talking to each other, right? Um, people were, by and large, develop, individual seminaries were all developing their own spiritual formation curriculum. They were doing their own uh, form of assessment. And there wasn't a context that brought people together to share lessons learned. Like, hey, this worked really well. This is what we're looking for. Um, let's kind of work on this, to, uh, this really big problem together. And we found that this lack of collaboration was even more pronounced uh, across ecclesial families, right? So uh, not only are the evangelical seminaries not talking to each other, but we're even talking less to our mainline counterparts and our Catholic counterparts. And the sad reality is that we can really learn a ton from uh, our brethren uh, from other ecclesial families, especially the Catholics, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And the third uh, guiding question was, um, how does the seminary experience, in fact, shape the character and spiritual life of seminary students? And perhaps um, you know, an, a, a relevant question might be, does it even shape uh, the spiritual life of uh, seminary students. When I was a seminarian, we had this long-running joke where you know, we called seminary spiritual cemetery. Um, 
So there's, a, there's also this fear of, well, if we actually do a good job assessing this, the data we come up with may not paint a very rosy picture, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's another potential you know, kind of political challenge that we might be uh, running into. That is, does seminary actually do what they set out to do? So this third question, um, does seminary in fact shape students' character and spiritual life, led us to a very important real world problem that the world of theological education is actually in the very midst of facing. The problem of accreditation and collecting data in support for accreditation. So as we, our work has brought us to uh, collaboration with ATS, the Association of Theological Schools, they're the main accrediting body of uh, seminaries in North America. And like many other uh, accrediting bodies of higher education, they are increasingly asking their member institutions to provide evidence, to provide data that they're actually accomplishing what they're set out to accomplish. So, for example, if you state in your seminary mission statement that the, the mission of the seminary is to shape the mind and character of your students in preparation for the ministry, you need to provide data now to actually demonstrate that uh, a student entering into your program and compare that with the same student exiting your program, that there actually was some discernible, observable change in their character as well as their spiritual life. So this real world problem, uh, how to accurately or robustly assess spiritual and character development of seminary students, actually provides a very unique opportunity for uh, theologians, philosophers, spiritual directors, psychologists, social scientists to work together because there are challenges inherent in this work that no one field of study is equipped to tackle all by themselves. We really need each other. Right? Um, and from the start we identified at least two challenges and I believe these are very much interdisciplinary challenges. And the first challenge is uh, from an ecumenical perspective, we need to define conceptually what it means to be spiritually formed, right? What are uh, observable markers of spiritual formation development? What are not only the evidences that formation has already occurred, but what are the ingredients, is, wh what are the ingredients of change? What are those processes that we can potentially connect to these outcomes that we are looking for? And another challenge that we're running into is the challenge of developing valid and reliable measurement instruments to observe and actually measure this change over time. And I've had the privilege of speaking to uh, Dan Alisher as well, the former executive director of ATS, on the challenges that ATS is facing when it comes to accreditation and assessment and spiritual formation. He raised a couple very interesting points. The first point is that, well, he believes, and I, actually, I, to I agree with him, that it is the Catholic seminaries that actually have the most well-developed uh, systems in place to support the spiritual formation of their students, and that for many Catholic seminaries, that these systems have been in place for several centuries, right? And part of the reason is because these theoretical frameworks from which they draw, uh, that, that they draw upon, such as you know, Ignatian spirituality, Benedictine, they've been around for centuries. Um, but one kind of uh, potential limitation of this is that because they've been around so long, many of them predate the Enlightenment, so there really isn't uh, kind of a ready place for things like empirical research. It, it just wasn't a part of the worldview as much uh, uh, before the Enlightenment. And on the other hand, the evangelical seminaries, while we will tend to be more open to empiricism as a valid source of knowledge, um, we've only begun to do this kind of thing for a couple decades, right? And many people trace this to uh, Richard Foster's book, uh, Celebration of Discipline, which was published just in 1978, right? So not only have we not been doing this very long, but we also don't have a central governing structure. So we're all kind of, by and large, left to do it all by ourselves, right? even though we can stand to learn much from each other. And as we pressed into, uh, even further into this work, we have run into additional challenges along the way. And the first and the most potent one is a practical consideration that there just aren't any standardized tools available, right? You can't just go on the web and search standardized spiritual formation assessment tool. There's noth nothing's gonna show up. You can search in the research literature, nothing's gonna be there, right? So, um, and because nothing like that exists, 
Um, I know many seminaries kind of are resorting to just kind of self-report, self-satisfaction surveys, which uh, the reliability uh, may be uh, questionable. And part of the problem is that, again, individual seminaries, they don't, uh, we don't have the bandwidth and the expertise to tackle this interdisciplinary problem, in, this inner institutional problem, uh, all by ourselves. There is some good news in the form of, at least in the psychology of religion and spirituality literature, uh, the John Templeton Foundation has been funding a ton of research uh, into developing measures of different virtues. So for example, one of my colleagues, Peter Hill, um, he received a large grant a couple of years ago to actually create measurement instruments on humility, right? So we now have, inst uh, and the, it's, it's, he, he has a lot of jokes about that because, you know, you can <laughs> ask questions about like, you know, I, how humble are you? Very humble, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, and there's nuances, in the, uh, but, um, but there are actually uh, instruments that exist. I mean, I know there's an instrument that exists on intellectual humility. Another promising instrument that recently came out in the literature is an instrument on cultural humility. Mm. Yeah. Um, however, even though the, these uh, instruments exist, unfortunately they've, they haven't been validated or normed on a seminarian population. They've been normed on primarily a general population. And we all know seminarians are kind of very particular. Uh, anyway, yeah, uh, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and as we're pressing into this kind of psychometric validation work as we're developing this instrument, we're encountering yet another set of challenges. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of you have already encountered some of these challenges. There's the challenge of self-report measures. So how, how accurate are we uh, in assessing our own spiritual development? Right? That's a, a very valid question in this uh, work. And part of the reason is because there is such a thing as social desirability bias. So if I c ask a question that is uh, aiming to measure a construct, and that's a good construct, if I ask in a way where the respondent knows what I'm asking for, they kind of know what we're looking for and they're going to answer accordingly, right? And as a result, they might overemphasize or kind of overestimate um, uh, their actual kind of wh where they're actually at. And relatedly, there's uh, what we call ceiling effects. So if we ask social de socially desirable questions, more often than not, everyone's going to answer in the affirmative. So we're not going to get very much variation. And when you don't get very much variation, the item is kind of not very helpful anymore. Right. Uh, later on, I'll be talking about some empirical precursors of spiritual de development that don't suffer from social desirability bias or as well as uh, ceiling bias. Um, uh, but I'll share that just in a few moments. There's also the notion of uh, illusory spiritual health. This idea that if you asked people to uh, answer questions about their spiritual development, chances are if they're earlier in their spiritual development and they haven't gone into that inward journey, they're probably going to be pretty optimistic and say they're pretty further, far along in the journey, right? Whereas those who actually are farther in the journey, they're aware of their true self and they're probably going, I'm doing horrible, <laughs> right? Um, so how do, we, how do we navigate the problem of illusory spiritual health? And then there's the question of, well, um, if I measure change in spiritual development, change in character development over time, am I expecting linear trajectories or am I expecting curvilinear trajectories? I grew up in church contexts where they always preached, you know, slow and steady and consistent and kind of a consistent up. But does that actually happen in real life, right? Um, and then last, can we reliably measure spiritual dynamics? which is a challenge in of itself. And then, can we actually track these changes, uh, changes in these dynamics uh, over time, which is another challenge. So, what I like to do is jump in to some of the literature that we have mined. And uh, un not surprisingly, there isn't very much out there that have looked at uh, spiritual development, character development from an empirical perspective as well as a longitudinal perspective. So it's not just one time point, but there's multiple time points so you can actually observe changes over time. And the first study that we found was by Reinert in 2005, and this was the only empirical longitudinal study involving Catholic seminaries, and he found that there was no significant changes in spirituality in his study. So that's uh, kind of a 
And one of the ways that he understood this finding was the following. At the start of the study, the seminarians were already a highly religious group, ceiling bias. You can't go, you can't go much higher when you already start off pretty high. And no measurable change occurred over time, or there were subtle changes and the scales were not sensitive enough to measure them. Notably, one limitation is that they only measure change over the course of a single academic year. And it might be the case that we need longer than that to actually um, observe and also experience uh, and receive uh, change in, in our spiritual life and our character. A second study that we found was published by Todd Hall, Yvonne Edwards, and myself in 19, uh, 2016. Uh, this study didn't involve seminary students, but it involved undergraduate students who were enrolled in CCCU universities. We actually followed one cohort of undergraduate students from their freshman year all for four years. So we had eight time points. And we found that changes in spirituality and character don't always follow a linear pattern. That in, they, in fact, uh, oftentimes follow a curvilinear U-shaped pattern as well as a curvilinear, curvilinear inverted uh, U-shaped pattern. So a linear pattern would look something like this. A curvilinear U-shaped pattern might look something like this. And then, again, the inverted U might look something like this. So let's start with the uh, curvilinear U-shaped trajectory. So this is uh, a trajectory where there is a negative trend in the first two years. So they might start off high, but it lowers. It decreases over the first two years, followed by a positive upward trend in years three and four. And they found this kind of we found this kind of trajectory in forgiveness, in uh, psychological well-being, as well as pro-social activities. Who's doing the assessment, David? Uh, this is self-assessment, self-report as well. Yeah. So there are limitations inherent to that. Yeah. We found an inverted U-shape. So, it, so uh, in other words, gains in the first two years followed by decline in years three to four in measures of religious involvement. So this involves, it includes church attendance, church involvement, engagement in social justice endeavors, and I think this is actually a positive thing, anxious attachment to God, this feeling that God's going to abandon you and you have to work really hard to keep him you know, with you. So, so this might be a good thing. Uh, we actually found a consistent linear downward trend when it comes to private spiritual practices, spiritual community, and overall spiritual well-being. So we found that in, among Christian undergrads, they actually their spirituality declined consistently through uh, all four years of their um, uh, uh, college experience. And we found a consistent linear upward trend uh, with regards to disappointment with God, spiritual instability, and spiritual questing, this idea that I'm not done seeking after the truth, I'm not done seeking after God, kind of a thing. What I want to do here is just pause for a few moments with the person next to you. What are, you, what, what are your reactions to this? Is it one of, um, like, I, yeah, I've kind of seen this, or is it more of like, a, this seems kind of surprising. Have you seen something similar among the students that you've worked with? Go ahead. There's one other um, set of studies that were uh, conducted, was conducted by Stephen Sandage, who used to uh, teach at Bethel Seminary, but now he's at Boston University. Um, and his work is, uh, to date, the most comprehensive work, kind of longitudinal empirical work, uh, concerning spiritual development, character development among seminary students. And he published over 25 studies based on his data sets, which was not only longitudinal, but involved over 2,500 participants in Bethel Seminary. Um, here are a couple highlights. He found that spiritual grandiosity and narcissism were positively correlated with extrinsic religiosity, egocentricity, and interpersonal alienation. So an item that measures interpersonal alienation is, you know, God speaks to me in a way that no one else can relate to, right? Um, he also found some interesting results on petitionary prayer, that if you are uh, in a kind of dark night or if you're, you're experiencing some spiritual uh, instability, that if you engage in petitionary prayer, uh, the, the, you have a higher likelihood to experience hopelessness uh, than, than others. And that this effect actually didn't apply to other forms of prayer, 
such as contemplative, uh, contemplative uh, forms of prayer. So Sandage identified two particularly robust predictors of spiritual development and spiritual maturity. And the first one is the construct of differentiation of self. And this is a construct that uh, he took from, the fam uh, from family systems theory. And it has to do with uh, one's capacity to navigate kind of these, this paradoxical set of relational needs of being both independent and autonomous and connected with other people. Right, so it's this idea of, you know, can, this question of can I be intimately connected to others without losing my own identity, right? And on the flip side, can I retain my own uniqueness and my own identity without spurning connection with others, without being that Marlboro man, right? And, and theologically speaking, I mean, I think there's some tr a lot of Trinitarian theology kind of pieces uh, kind of uh, talks about this uh, in uh, kind of the intro relations, uh, the, inter the relationships between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But uh, a very pertinent example of this or illustration of this comes from Bonhoeffer's Life Together where he says, let him who cannot be alone beware of community. Let him who is not in community beware of being alone. Each by itself has profound perils and pitfalls. One who wants fellowship without solitude plunges into the void of words and feelings, and the one who seeks solitude without fellowship perishes in the abyss of vanity, self-infatuation, and despair. That, that one's ability to navigate those, that, those two, that, the paradox of connectedness and autonomy, that that has robust and consistent implications on our spiritual development. The second um, uh, predictor of spiritual development was actually intercultural competence. Mm. So it's one's sensitivity, one's competence, one's disposition towards navigating interactions with people from different cultural backgrounds, right? So th there's something about being able to see and relate to the other without imposing an image of yourself and your own culture onto that other, that there's something about that ability that di plays directly on our relationship with God. Perhaps that speaks to uh, our natural human tendency to project an image of our own culture onto God. Um, for example, to, to remind people, at least in our context, that you know, Jesus was an American, right? Um, and that confusion can very well be related to how far along we are in our spiritual journey, right? Could it, could it be the other way around, though? It could also be the other way around. Absolutely, especially if you're in touch with uh, God as transcendent, right? And this is an ATS program requirement, this language of intercultural competence. It's something we all ought to be working on. Yeah. Can you guys speak to then, have, have you weaved these two things within the assessment tool that y'all are creating? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's going to be a core component of our um, our assessment uh, tool. And uh, in some of my interactions with uh, my Catholic seminary counterparts, I was, I was just floored by how uh, deeply integrated their spiritual formation thinking and uh, work is with intercultural competence. I, I remember speaking to a spiritual director at Mount Angel Seminary, which is an hour south of Port Portland, Oregon. And he told me how uh, during spiritual direction, they would actually observe, if they observe a seminarian only hanging out with other seminarians that are like him, that look like him, that are, you know, it's the same country, they would actually give them feedback and say, hey, you need to spend more time with your brother from Mexico because he's part of the family of God as well, right? And as we dialogued about how in the Catholic Church, there's only one Catholic Church, so if you're rich or poor, if you're white or black, it's all, you all go in the same church, and how different it is for us evangelicals where we have a very homogenous and segregated uh, churches, much of which I think was, has been kind of uh, uh, spurned by kind of the church growth movement, because that, you're kind of playing on top of base human nature to, to grow churches and get people to congregate. Yeah. So there are uh, research studies that link intercultural competence with virtues such as humility, gratitude, spiritual well-being, uh, meditative prayer, 
Intercultural competence is also linked negatively with spiritual instability, spiritual grandiosity, and various uh, forms of insecure uh, attachment to God. And what I want to do to end our time together is to pose this last question that we, and this is the same question that we uh, posed to our entire uh, project team on our grant. And the question is this, if your, if your institution were to use an assessment tool to track the spiritual life and character change of your seminary students, what are the things that must be included in it? Or in other words, what qualities or indicators point to the reality that formation has actually occurred? In your students and you know these could be virtues these could be practices they could be behaviors and if we had time I'd, I would love to invite you to discuss this with each other and then we'd have a large group discussion but we unfortunately don't have time so what I will do instead is uh, share a couple highlights uh, uh, from uh, what our team came up with and then I'll leave you with that and if you want to stay and chat with us afterwards we'd uh, look forward to that and if you are, are you